Chapter three, but I don't know how. Letting go of the unknown. We are a people of the know. If we don't know something, we panic and become pathetic. Most of the frustration comes from not knowing a three-letter word. That word is how. I don't know when, and I might not know where, but when I don't know how, I get scared, worried, and lose my peace. I can figure out where I'm going and who I'm supposed to be with, but not knowing how sends me into the unknown. That's panic. To truly love others and to meet the needs of people with the hands of Jesus, we need to get beyond the letting go of the unknown. The unknown's not knowing how to do something and let God move us to do something. We don't want to embrace the unknown. After all, we don't know what's around the corner. How could we possibly embrace something we don't know or understand? There are several things that happen when we let go of what we do not understand. The first thing that happens is we lose the appearance that we are in control of our lives. We want to know so we can appear in control. Knowing doesn't necessarily mean we're in control, but when we appear, we can appear to have our oars in the water and give other directions. When we don't know, we must step back and depend on someone or something other than our own control. That brings us to the second thing that happens when we don't know what's happening. We don't have a handle on our emotions as well when we don't know what our emotions might be because we don't know how to do something. These uncomfortable unknowns are our lack of knowledge or control or planning or a change in our comfort zone. Often we don't have the knowledge to love people and obey where God is leading us. We just have the nudge of the Holy Spirit. When we are asked to do things we don't know how to do, we lose our sense of control. Humanity wants to have control over things. Divinity has control. Those are things we struggle with in our faith walk. Our humanity wants to be in control. God's divinity says the only way we can walk by faith is to let him be in control. That goes against our planning because we can't plan. And that places us outside a comfort zone. We get nervous, we get irritated, and we tell God we can't because we don't understand the parameters. We don't know how. Yet amazingly enough, not knowing how gives us the opportunity to do things that God can do through us. The don't know actions require us to go beyond the things we understand and step into a world of God actions. We must open our hands to reach outward. When we do the things we know how to do, we tend to stay within the guidelines because we are comfortable. We know how to do it. Why would we try something else when we know how? We have always done it that way. We were successful doing it that way. We were right and we were loud. When we don't know how, it forces us to step back and breathe a different atmosphere. It also forces us to open our hearts to ask others. Now, there's something hum- humbling about asking. It doesn't matter what we're asking. It's just hard. I really don't have a problem with it. I love to find a helpful smile in every aisle and high V to help me find what I need. I seek out the guys in blue vests and Menards when I need something. I'm not proud. But aside from Menards and high V, it might take a different turn. When we ask, we're putting ourselves in the I have no clue how camp. We are in the camp and we just don't want anyone to know that we're in that camp. It's, it's, it's not hard to watch someone look and not find something. You just look around everywhere in life. Matt Walmart, Home Depot, even Quick Trip will show you people looking for something that they can't find. It's not hard. We see it all over. It doesn't help either then. Then the stores change where everything's are often enough and they want to force you in their store to shop longer. We also must open our minds to learn. There's nothing more frustrating than working with someone who doesn't know how to learn. They are content with what they know and they see no reasons to broaden their horizons. Well, why should I learn that? What I know is good enough for me. When we don't know how and need to ask, we need to be willing to learn. Learning is always a humbling experience. It's sometimes a lot of fun, but it's humbling. Especially when teachers are much younger than you and know more than you and don't mind reminding you that there are books for dummies you could buy to help you. We also must open our emotions to trust. When we don't have information, we need to trust others that the information they're giving us is right. It's easier said than done. Trusting and then believing. With technology, one never stops learning. Just when you think you've learned it, out comes an updated version of Windows and throws you into a 911 technology or a Geek Squad lifeline. Even when they tell you what you need to do and do it, it makes no sense. But you have to trust that they are on the other side telling you they have information you need. Yes, it sounds crazy to push control and alt delete and your screen goes black, but trust them and do it. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God gave us a spirit of fear, 
not of fear, but of power and of love and self-control. What? He didn't give us the spirit of knowing everything? He didn't give us the spirit of being in control of our circumstances? He didn't give us the spirit of knowing how to miraculously handle all our situations with ease and confidence? Nope. It's interesting the order of words after telling us to drop panic and fear, power, love, and self-control. It's not our power. It's not our love. And by looking at how we handle life, it's not our self-control. God gave us a spirit, the Holy Spirit. Once offered and accepted, he takes over our knowing how to and gives us a chance to fly by the seat of his pants, not our pants. That's an idiom. Fly by the seat of our pants refers to winging it. It originated in Great Britain, and the original phrase was, fly by the seat of his trousers. Of course, us Americans had to change it in the 30s to pants. In fact, according to Oxford, it turns to relying on instinct rather than logic or knowledge. That about nails it. When I fly off by the seat of my pants, I kind of just go. GPS, don't need it. Map, won't read it. Advice, won't take it. I will fly by the seat of my pants right into a brick wall. But when we fly by the seat of the Holy Spirit, it's deeper than logic and knowledge. It's applied wisdom. When we don't know how, we don't need to know how. We just need to know who, and then the how gets handled quite easily. We began Saturday Night Live in 1993 at our local church. Now, this would be an outreach for ministry at a Saturday night and reach the hearts of those who would not normally walk into a building, church building especially. It was held in a family center or gym, and it was different than the other services. Well, I was pregnant and worked with the musicians, so they didn't have to rely on me. And sure enough, Tyler was born the day before opening night. Two of the musicians and singers came up to the hospital to visit me, and I told them they'd be fine. And they were fine, and it became a wonderful chapter in our life. In that chapter, we made friends with two wonderful and crazy old people. They came on Saturday night and loved the music. She was always singing, raising her hands, almost dancing, and he, well, <laughs> he just stood and smiled. We got to be good friends. Anita and Frank moved to Rochester so she could be close to Mayo Clinic with her cancer issues. A year after we'd begun the work on Saturday, Anita's cancer was advancing and she was struggling. Well, I felt I needed to do something, so I called up another singer in the worship team and told her I felt called to go sing for them, but I didn't want to go alone. Well, Paula agreed to go with me. So I picked her up and we drove to her town, the townhouse. And we prayed together, and then we had five songs or so, and we planned on singing, and we got up and went and knocked on the door. Now, Anita was in a hospital bed, and we were greeted by Frank, his sister Mildred, and a niece. We went over and stood by the hospital bed and began singing. You know, God honors the totally clueless. We sang. Anita raised her hands and began singing with us. We didn't think that was a big deal because that's what Anita did. However, the other three people in the room were going crazy. They were running around whispering, trying to find a tape recorder, then recording our singing and Anita singing. Only after we were all done and headed out the door did we hear the rest of the story. Anita had been slowly declining and the doctor had been there earlier in the day and told them she would probably pass that night. She had not been responsive to them all day and they were preparing to usher her home to heaven. Then we showed up. We didn't know how to minister. We just did what was totally out of the box and out of our comfort zone. When she began singing and lifting her hands, they could not believe what they were seeing and hearing. As God would have it, Anita changed that night and lived almost another year after that. Did we know how we should minister? Nope. I just knew we had to do something. Another friend was having a rough time with life and I wanted to do something, but I didn't know how or what. I prayed about it and wrote a card. You know, there's a saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I never got the card mailed Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. Finally, out of desperation, so I wouldn't forget, I tossed it in the mail late Wednesday night thinking I was a total failure. I didn't know how to encourage her, and then I couldn't remember to mail the letter. And it was the only thing I could come up with. I later learned the rest of the story. She had found out she was pregnant. But at the same time, her husband told her he was leaving and had another woman pregnant. She had been at the hospital alone with some issues with the pregnancy in the middle of the night, came home alone. She went to the mailbox, three in the morning, the letter was there. I didn't know how. God not only knew how, but also when. It wasn't that I kept forgetting. God at a special time, she would need that card. It would be in the middle of the night on a horrible ending of a terrible bad day. I had no, oh, I had no idea how to help. But I had let God move my hands to write. I couldn't seem to remember to mail the card, but God kept me forgetting until the right time and he would orchestrate my heart that would make her feel loved when she felt so lonely and forgotten. Don't underestimate God's how with your lack of understanding how. 
You may not know how. It has nothing to do with the opportunities God has waiting for you. You must, however, be willing to have no clue what to do and be okay with not knowing. You must be willing to give up control and get out of your comfort zone. You must be willing to be asked and trust that God will put the right people in your place at the right time. You must be willing to give up your part to let him write a new role that might not be the part you wanted to play, but it's the part God had written just for you, even if you don't know how.